so nice to see all of you again here and welcome to this uh, last talk of the series, The Poets of the Four Last Things. Now, after giving us um, what I think were subtle, scholarly, and at the same time, very spiritual introductions to the poetry of Dunn, of Herbert, and of Hopkins, um, respectively on death, judgment, and heaven, Robert this evening is giving us a taste of Eliot's poetry and thoughts on hell. As Robert mentioned at the beginning, there is a long tradition um, in Christian meditation of the four last things in Advent. Advent is a time of waiting, of course, of waiting for the birth of Christ, and so we are celebrating the incarnation, but it's also a time of waiting for the second coming of Christ. And therefore, we are called to reflect on the four last things, what our afterlife will be like. And in that tradition, hell came last. Why? You know, we would like to think death, judgment, hell, heaven, and end with heaven. But in fact, the last meditation was on hell. And why? I do not know whether Robert has got an answer to that and, and, and uh, something in store for us, but perhaps it's worthwhile reflecting on this, and particularly in the light of Danton's Inferno, uh, which was so dear to uh, Eliot. Uh, Eliot often quotes from Dante's Inferno and alludes to it. But before we start, I just wanted to remind uh, um, you a few things, uh, practical things. There are still some books of Robert's poems there on the table, and they are on sale if you want them, 10 pounds. Uh, two books of the Power of the Word series, and information on how you can get discounted copies of the Power of the Word um, uh, publications. And um, yes, finally, I've prepared photocopies of Eliot's texts. I think everyone has got those texts, but in case, they're there on the table. The classical sequence of the last four things lands us in hell. But having arrived, we might well wonder what we are doing here. The location is to a high degree problematical, not least because it comes last. To help us to orientate ourselves, we are in sore need of a companion. Because uh, poets are sometimes the best guide to ultimate things. For the poet we'll be talking about tonight, so it happens, hell was, as we shall soon see, something of a family tradition. He, in his turn, was guided by a much earlier poet without whom his understanding of any of the last things is incomprehensible. The most vivid evocation of the destinations of the human soul in European literature, of course, is Dante's. So you might be wondering why so far we haven't yet addressed him in this series. The reason is that during the centuries when Dunn and Herbert flourished, he was wrapped, at least so far as the English-speaking world was concerned, in a cloud of unknowing, or perhaps of prejudice. By the time of Hopkins, Dante and his work were slowly being rediscovered. For all that, there are a mere three references to him in all of Hopkins's works. By the end of the 19th century, however, Dante was slowly coming to be seen as important again in England and in America. In America, this was largely the doing of that versatile Harvard professor, Charles Eliot Norton, whose name many of you will recognize from the title of the widely used Norton Anthology of English Literature. Norton had translated La Divina Commedia into serviceable prose and also written one of the first critical biographies of the Florentine poet in English. 
He came from a large and academically distinguished family with strong Unitarian roots. He also possessed a clutch of talented cousins, one of whom was the president of Harvard in his own time, Charles William Eddie Elliot. Another was a not so promising lad with prominent ears, whose father ran a brick company from Locust Street, St. Louis, Missouri, and was a pillar of the local branch of the Unitarian Church. This young man was called Thomas Stearns Elliot, and when in his turn he came up to Harvard and as an, as an undergraduate in 1906, Norton had only two years to live and Charles William Elliot three more years to run as president. T.S. Eliot was an academic slow starter who as a freshman scored a string of C's and was once put on probation for his slackness in Latin. In his spare time, though, he wrote poetry about St. Narcissus, some lines from which were to wheedle their way into his later masterpiece, The Wasteland. The Wasteland was a product of the early 1920s, by which time Tom had redeemed his reputation as a scholar, taken graduate courses in Sanskrit and Pali, had read the Buddha's fire sermon in the original, migrated to France and then England, had written a doctoral thesis on idealist philosophy, and was being touted for a faculty position back in the family's alma mater. But he'd also recently married a vivacious, though unstable, English woman called Vivian Haig Wood, to support whom he had accepted a clerical job in the colonial and foreign division of Lloyd's Bank in London, which perversely he rather enjoyed. During his lunch breaks, he took to exploring the streets of the city with a copy of Dante's Inferno in his jacket pocket. When The Wasteland was published in 1922, he had been at the bank for five years. His marriage to Vivian was intensely strained, his father had recently died, and he was tormented by recurrent bouts of psychosomatic illness, both Vivian's and his own. When at the end of section one of the poem, aptly entitled The Burial of the Dead, he describes the morning commuters pouring across to their offices in the city from London Bridge Station, he compares them to the queue of pitiful cowards in Canto Three of the Inferno, waiting forlornly outside the gateway to hell, creatures so spineless that in life they had, had not even had the gumption to rebel. The addition of Dante, this diligent bank clerk carried with him, was the two-volume Temple Classics one with the Italian and an English translation on facing pages. For all that, it is his American cousin's prose translation he echoes at this point, while carefully observing Dante's line breaks. Si lunga tratta di gente, che io non avrei creduto, che morte tanta n'avesse disfatta, or as Norton has it, a train of folk that I could never have believed death had done, had done so many. And as Eliot reworked that in The Wasteland in 1922, so many I had not thought death had undone so many. The quotation was no passing whim. No poet was to fertilize Eliot's imagination more permanently than Dante. Not even Jules Le Fourg, whose voice is to be heard across so much of the early published verse, or Dunn or Herbert, on both of whom he was lecturing in Cambridge four years after the publication of The Wasteland. The hell of that poem is a crowded place and a sadly anonymous one. Yet every few yards there looms out of this anonymous mass a face that he recognizes, a face strained, suffering, and for all that resiliently noble. Among the faces is surely his own. Eliot is one of the crowd on the bridge, one of the denizens of this imagined, if not imaginary, infernal region. What he's doing there, and for what crime or sin he is atoning, it is hard to tell. Though Bertrand Russell, who knew him well at the time, 
attributed to him symptoms of cruelty of what he called a peculiarly Dostoevskian order, by which I take him to have meant not merely that, Eliot, that the, the Eliot he sensed behind the social mask was gripped in the vice of crime and punishment, but, bit, but that he, his was a sort of cruelty that was aware of itself. That other poet, Rowan Williams, has recently said that Dostoevsky's stories are all about accepting responsibility, even for things you did not quite mean to do. There's little doubt that at the time Eliot was weighed down by such feelings, perhaps because he was acutely aware that his marriage was failing. There was also surely a tiny bit of himself that identified with that louche thug, the Sweeney of the Sweeney poems, whom I take to be a Bostonian Irishman, though he also has something in him of that misogynistic murderer, Sweeney Todd. In the cabaret-like fragment of an Aegon attached to the Aristophanic melodrama Sweeney Agonistes, Eliot Sweeney chants, any man has to, needs to, wants to, once in a lifetime do a girl in. <laughs> Eliot had been working on Sweeney Agonistes since 1923. Six years later, in the essay Dante of 1929, second of Faber's series of poets on poets, he declared, I have found no other poet than Dante to whom I could apply continually for so many purposes and with such profit during a familiarity of 20 years. He had been reading La Divina Commedia since he was 19 that the trying personal circumstances of the 1920s brought the inferno to the forefront of his imagination is scarcely surprising. The other Stygian model to hand for an English language poet was, of course, book one of Milton's Paradise Lost. But Milton does not actually visit hell. Like the Puritan he indubitably was, he views the place from the outside with lingering moral disapproval. Milton's Satan is a case in point, suave but scarcely noble. In his, his essay on Dante, um, <laughs> Eliot calls him curly-haired and Byronic. To us, though, Milton's arch villain is more likely to bring in mind Boris Beelzebub in full flood, even if his hair and grammar are in better shape. Dante, in sharp contrast, not simply visits hell, but regards each of its inmates with transformative compassion. They include Ulysses, consigned to the Eighth Circle for the overblown rhetoric with which he encouraged his companions to topple over the edge of the known world an act heroic, but in terms of the geography of his time, foolhardy. But they also include people close to Dante in time, place, and sympathy. Prominent among these, detained within the third ring of the seventh cycle, is Brunetto Latini, Guelph notable, an author in Tuscan and French, who acted as Dante's guardian following the death of his father around 1281. The conversation they hold together is, is of one of affectionate, if sorrowing, respect, with Dante addressing his erstwhile master with the reverential voy, and Latini addressing him with the familiar too. Latini had been, Dante tells us, the one who taught him to think of the soul as immortal. And now Francesca will read this episode. You have the Italian on your chairs, um, and I will put up Norton's translation. Dante, Inferno, canto 15. Così addocchiato da cotal famiglia, fui conosciuto da un che mi prese per lo lembo e gridò qual maraviglia. E io, quando il suo braccio a me distese, ficcai gli occhi per lo cotto aspetto sì che il viso abbruciato non difese la conoscenza sua al mio intelletto. E chinando la mano alla sua faccia risposi, siete voi qui, ser Brunetto? E quelli, 
«Oh figliol mio, non ti dispiace se Brunetto Latino un poco teco ritorna indietro e lascia andare la traccia?» E io dissi lui «Quanto posso ven preco, e se volete che con voi masseggia, farol, se piace a costui che vo seco». «Oh figliol, disse, qual di questa greggia s'arresta appunto?» Giace poi cent'anni senza arrostarsi quando il fuoco il feggia. Però va oltre, io ti verrò a panni, e poi rigiugnerò la mia masnada che va piangendo i suoi eterni danni. Io non osava scendere dalla strada per andar par di lui, ma il capo chino tenea come uom che reverente vada. E il cominciò. Qual fortuna o destino, anzi l'ultimo di qua giù ti mena? E chi è questi che mostra il cammino? Lassù di sopra, in la vita serena, risposi io lui, mi smarrì in una valle, avanti che l'età mia fosse piena. Purier mattina le volsi le spalle, questi m'apparve, tornandio in quella, e reducemi a ca per questo colle. Ed egli a me, se tu segui tua stella, non puoi fallire a glorioso porto, se ben m'accorsi nella tua vita bella. E se io non fossi sì per tempo morto, veggendo il cielo a te il così benigno, dato t'avrei all'opera conforto. Nobody even now is quite sure what Latini is doing in hell. The ring in which he is held is reserved for sodomites, that the episode concerns does not mention his sexuality at all. He's a guide, a mentor, and an inspiration, and he's portrayed in the closing lines of the canto as running like a contestant in the annual Lent tide race of the Greek green cloth in Verona, like a winner, in Dante's words, not like a loser. This is certainly how Eliot viewed him since 20 years after the publication of The Wasteland, Latini's presence is felt in the fourth of Eliot's four quartets, Little Gidding, and that's Little Gidding Church, to which we referred in our second lecture two weeks ago. That poem was written at the height of the London Blitz in 1941, when Eliot served as a fire watcher on the roof of Faber and Faber. It is alive with images of fire and burning. And in the middle of it, he encounters a so-called compound ghost, some dead master whom I, I had long known, with whom he discusses the necessities of art. The ghost tells him that old age brings no solace, but continual exposure to agonizing self-reproach, the rending pain of reenactment of what you have done and been. In the published text, the spectre is unnamed, but in all of the early drafts, he is quite clearly labeled as Brunetto Latini, which of course, in this imagined dialogue, places Eliot himself in the position of Dante. Uh, Francesco, I think you could demur at that point. <laughs> well, it's... Um, well, Yeats, yes. Yeats had only just died, remember? Yeah, only just uh, died. Two years before. And this is a poet whom he'd long known. Had he long known Yeats? He really rather disliked. Himself, you know, the relationship that Dante had with Brunetto Latini. Yeah. What kind of relationship? Which isn't Le Fork. I, I, think yeah, it's, yeah. I, think, I think it's Latini, actually. Because, after all, the advice which the ghost gives is to purify the dialect of the tribe. And that's precisely what. Dante appreciated in, in Latini, who, who wrote pure Tuscan Italian. I mean, isn't that one of the things that he appreciated in his mentor and guide? Don't you think? Well, he actually says, I mean, I, I don't want to quote chapter in verse, but in, in his, his essay, Dante, that he wrote a few years later, he picks up uh, Latini and Ulysses as the two you know, high points of of the Inferno, and it's quite obvious. He refers to him two or three times in the, in the essay, which is more than he refers to any other Danteesque character. Yeah. 
But I mean, there are, I mean, just to say, in the Beinecke Library in Yale, there are successive drafts of Little Gidding. And in the early ones, it's Brunetto Latini, in a couple of other ones, it's Yeats, and then it ends up as this compound figure who may, in fact, be a symbol of poetic tradition, tradition in the individual talent, or the talent queuing up, making a compound tradition. At this point, it might be opportune to ask what it might have meant for one raised in and conditioned by the Unitarianism of the American South and New England to imagine himself in Inferno. Unitarianism, of course, rejects not only Trinitarian Christianity, but the Augustinian doctrine of original sin as well, and with it the notion of hell as a place of eternal torment where we are eternally published, uh, punished because of our beliefs and actions during life. It is not, for the Unitarians, a place that we go after death. Rather, it is a state of consciousness we suffer here on earth. It is this condition that Eliot's early poetry evokes, a place of nullity, squalor, and boredom to which we all of us are occasionally reduced. It makes absolutely no sense at all unless we as readers recognize it as a location um, that each of us spasmodically inhabits. It is a place of consequences, deeply serious, and at the same time, terribly immediate. All of which serves to explain Eliot's reaction when in 1925, his old friend Ezra Pound, Emilio Fabro of the Wasteland, published his own version of Inferno. It took the form of two scatological cantos, numbers 14 and 15 of his work in progress, now often referred to as the Hell Cantos. Pound began with a one-line quotation from Dante's Canto V, Io veni in luogo d'ogni luce muto, where Dante is about to encounter Minos the judge with the many coils of his tail and the shades of the unwisely libidinous, which include Francesca da Rimini and her brother-in-law Paolo. Dante's account of these episodes is suffused with pity and fellow feeling, all the more so because Paolo and Francesca were seduced by the act of reading. But Pound had stuffed his hell full of the characters he simply disliked or despised. Corrupt bankers, seedy politicians, sensationalist journalists, and anybody at all who might conceivably be blamed for the First World War. There was not even a glimmering of a suggestion that Pound himself might qualify. Eliot delayed his response to this travesty until 1933. But then in After Strange Gods, his biblically entitled diatribe against secularism, he spoke out loud and clear. From After Strange Gods. At this point, I shall venture to generalize and suggest that with the disappearance of the idea of original sin, with the disappearance of the idea of intense moral struggle, the human beings presented to us both in poetry and in prose fiction today, and more patently among the serious writers than in the underworld of letters, tend to become less and less real. It is in fact in moments of moral and spiritual struggle depending upon spiritual sanctions rather than in those bewildering minutes in which we're all very much alike that men and women come nearest to being real. If you do away with this struggle and maintain that by tolerance, benevolence, inoffensiveness and a redistribution or increase of purchasing power combined with a devotion on the part of an elite to art, the world will be as good as anyone could require then you must expect human beings to become more and more vaporous. This is exactly what we find of the society which Mr. Pound puts in hell in his draft of 30 cantos. 
It consists, I may have overlooked one or two species, of politicians, profiteers, financiers, newspaper proprietors and their hired men, Agent Provocateur, Calvin, St. Clement of Alexandria, the English, vice crusaders, liars, the stupid, pedants, preachers, those who do not believe in social credit, bishops, lady golfers, Fabians, conservatives and imperialists and all those who have set money last before the pleasures of the senses. It is in this way an admirable hell, without dignity, without tragedy. At first sight, the variety of types, for these are types and not individuals, may be a little confusing, but I think it becomes a little more intelligible if we see at work three principles. One, the aesthetic, two, the humanitarian, three, the Protestant. And I find one considerable objection to a hell of this sort, that a hell altogether without dignity implies a heaven without dignity also. If you do not distinguish between individual responsibility and circumstances in hell, between essential evil and social accidents, then the heaven, if any implied, will be equally trivial and accidental. Mr. Pound's hell, for all its horrors, is a perfectly comfortable one for the modern mind to contemplate and disturbing to no one's complacency. It is a hell for the other people, the people we read about in the newspapers, not for oneself and one's friends. Is that a passage which is familiar to you? Yes. I think one of the things he's saying actually is that uh, Pound's reading of hell is not true the Dante-esque understanding of hell. Because I, 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 I suppose we, we have to consider the nature of theology here. Theologically, hell is a place from which you cannot escape. But the hell of Dante seems to be full of characters who, according to Eliot, actually transcend what he calls the scheme of the poem. And the scheme of the poem is rigorously inferno, Paradis, um, Purgatorio Paradiso. But if you like, take characters like Brunetto Latini or even more Ulysses, I mean, uh, uh, T.S. is very insistent on this in his Dante essay, they do transcend that condition. Uh, Brunetto does, Latini does not cease to be wise. Ulysses does not cease to be heroic. Uh, whereas for Pound, hell is simply a place where you consign people forever whom you strongly dislike. Any comments on that? Sir? That's if we should ask the ecclesiastical historian in the second row. <laughs> um, well, I think hell is a rhetoric. At what time does the tripartite division between heaven, hell, and purgatory sort of settle in as an item in Catholic doctrine? Well, um, I mean, purgatory, yes. I, I think it's a little But for Eliot, anyway, I mean, I think we're all potentially occupants of hell, and it is a permanent threat we have to take very seriously. For Eliot, then, hell, hell is an inclusive condition an existential one to which we are all prone. In these terms, either we are all potentially damned or nobody is. This is not specifically a modern condition, but part of what makes us human. We are all in it, Pound and Eliot, me and you included. <coughs> nobody more so than Eliot, whose marriage continued to disintegrate throughout the 1920s. In 1933, the couple separated. In 1938, Vivian's brother had her committed to an asylum in North London, where she died of a heart attack nine years later. Not once did Eliot visit her, a fact that is understandable, but perhaps hardly forgivable, even by Eliot himself. There are those, including Vivian's biographer, Carol Seymour Jones, who blame Eliot for the whole sorry saga. Almost certainly, he blamed himself. <coughs> At this time, Eliot told a friend that in order to survive, he had deliberately turned himself into a machine. His drug was routine, more and more deadening work. 
a monk-like celibate existence that eventually led him to share a Spartan flat in Carlisle Mansions, Chelsea, with his friend, the scholar John Hayward, to whom we are indebted for much of the existing archive. Members of the Bloomsbury group, including Virginia Woolf, found him fascinating but amusing. To others who knew him only slightly, he seemed like one dead. In 1940, Dylan Thomas and his friend John Davenport wrote a parody of the four quartets, which were appearing one by one. It was not published until Eliot's death. They called it East Abelard, a not so subtle dig at Eliot's symbolic castration. Yet, for much of this time, Eliot was outwardly successful. An increasingly influential publisher, editor of the most eminent poetry list in the country for Fabers, whose offices then lay just off Woburn Square. They're now, now part of SOAS, SOAS, and there's a plaque on the wall. In that capacity, he served as a mentor for several generations of younger writers, whose views, for the most part, were radically opposed to his own, men such as Auden and Spender. One poet whom he accepted onto the list in 1935 was the 22-year-old half-Irish writer George Barker. When in 1986 Faber commissioned me to edit Barker's new collected poems, I asked him about his impressions of Eliot the Man. Oh yes, he growled through his emphysema. He remembered him very well. Eliot um, lived in an apartment block on, on the Charing Cross Road. This was some time before Chelsea. He always wore green eye shadow. He was kindly and unfailingly perceptive, but ever so slightly sinister. If you called on him at home, you announced your arrival to the concierge downstairs, to whom, however, you were not to mention Eliot's name, since the concierge did not know it. Instead, you were to ask courteously whether the captain was in. If he was, you were shown up. It was this Eliot, outwardly respectable, inwardly numb, who in 1925 published a kind of extended dramatic chorus in which he universalized his state of accidy to encompass the whole of the world. I almost said the whole modern world, but to do that would, I think, be to trivialize it. The Hollow Men carried one ep epigraph from the traditional cry of children displaying stuffed effigies of Guy Fawkes in the build-up to Bonfire Night, a reference that must need footnoting in America. The other epigraph is a one-line quote from Conrad's Heart of Darkness, a tale that begins in the port of London where the seasoned mariner Marlowe announces, and this too has been one of the dark places of the earth, before relating a voyage made some years previously up the river Congo. Again, in Conrad's eyes, London is portrayed as a sort of hell. Heart of Darkness, after all, is less about Africa than the rotten entrails of Europe. And my son and I will now read you the hollow men. You have uh, in your pamphlets, I think you have the first section, but we'll read the whole thing as well as we can in chorus. Right. The hollow men, a penny for the old guy. Okay. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. Leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Alas. Our dried voices, when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless, as wind in dry grass or rat's feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. Shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. Those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom remember us, if at all, not as lost violent souls, but only as the hollow men the stuff men. Eyes I dare not meet in dreams, in death's dream kingdom, these do not appear. There the eyes are sunlight on a broken column, 
There is a tree swinging, and voices are in the wind singing, more distant and more solemn than a fading star. Let me be no nearer in death's dream kingdom. Let me also wear such deliberate disguises, rat's coat, crow skin, cross staves, in a field behaving as the wind behaves, no nearer. Not that final meeting in the twilight kingdom. This is the dead land. This is the cactus land. Here the stone images are raised. Here they receive the supplication of a dead man's hand under the twinkle of a fading star. Is it like this in death's other kingdom, waking alone at the hour when we are trembling with tenderness, lips that would kiss form prayers of broken stone? The eyes are not here. There are no eyes here in this valley of dying stars, in this hollow valley, this broken jaw of our lost kingdoms. In this last of our meeting places, we grope together and avoid speech gathered on this beach of the tumid river. Sightless, unless the eyes reappear as a perpetual star, multifoliate rows of death's twilight kingdom the hope only of empty men. Here we go round the prickly pear, the prickly pear, prickly pear. Here we go round the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning. Between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls the shadow. For thine is the kingdom. Between the conception and the creation, between the emotion and the response, falls the shadow. Life is very long. Between the desire and the spasm, between the potency and the existence, between the essence and the descent, falls the shadow. For thine is the kingdom. For, for thine is, is, life is, is for thine is, is the, this is the way the, the world, world ends. ends, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. Um, comments on <laughs> this is a poem written two years before his conversion. It's written in 1925. He's converted and accepted into the Anglican Church in 1927. Do you think this is potentially a Christian poem? Rose. Yes. That could come from the Rosicrucians, it could come from a lot of people, it could come from Yeats. And Dante. It's definitely a Dante expert. I just said multi I would say it's a dramatic poem, but would you call it a liturgical poem? No, except that it does quote from the liturgy. But it doesn't enact liturgy. I mean, I asked, I gave this lecture last last year in front of a parish conversation I actually said to them when's the last time we all read something out together and they immediately said the creed and I think Eliot did envisage it being read in chorus like that almost like a, an anti-congregation reciting a statement of sort of anti-belief the, um, the, the mulberry bush yeah, yes Yes. We didn't do it, but I, 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 did, I don't know. Were there dramatic performances of the Hollow Men in the 1920s, do you know, Francesca? Because, he, of course, he was building up to a career as a playwright. And Sweeney Agonistes was written for the theatre. A lot of these things, um, he supplied choruses for The Rock, but that's slightly later on. Uh, Murder in the Cathedral, yes, is a bit later on. It's about ten years later on. Um, shadow is a term in Jungian psychology, yeah. but I don't know whether um, Elliot was interested. But the line that springs out from the page to me is about death's other kingdom. Now, what is death's other kingdom? Right. 
This is who, sorry? Merton. Merton. I thought you said Merton, yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Right. I'm still not sure about Deaths of the Kingdom. It sounds very Dante-esque to me. I, I think the Hollow Men was, was left over from the wasteland. I mean, he's, he's endlessly recycling lines, of course. This isn't quite so much pastiche, and it doesn't go into other languages, and it doesn't quote Dante or Sanskrit in the original. It's a strongly vernacular poem. To me, it's like a poem about people who are permanently trapped in hell and just can't get out. But it's a hell which is here and now, as if we are all in hell now. It's about death in life. I, I would argue that the Wasteland is potentially a Christian poem, actually, because there's a dearth. And what's it a dearth of? It's a dearth of spirituality. Quite clearly, he's been reaching out throughout the early 20s for an alternative. To me, it seems he's hovering on the edge of something like conversion. Two years after publishing The Hollow Men, Eliot delivered a course of lectures at Trinity College, Cambridge, on the varieties of metaphysical poetry that covered Dunn and Herbert, amongst others. The following March, he accompanied his brother Henry and sister-in-law, Teresa, to Rome on one stage of their extended honeymoon. They visited the Vatican, and as they approached the Michelangelo Pietà to the south of the west end of St. Peter's, Teresa looked across and noticed that Tom had fallen to his knees. On 29th of June that year, he was received into the Church of England at Holy Trinity Church in the village of Finstock in Oxfordshire. From then on, Eliot was a communicant member of the Church of England, where he worshipped every Sunday. During the week, he travelled by underground to his office off Russell Square, from Gloucester Road to Russell Square Station. Unsurprisingly, T.S. Eliot's abiding image of modern emptiness remains the city, which is sometimes London, the unreal city of the wasteland, sometimes a recreated St. Louis or Boston or even Paris. Yet for him, for Eliot, it was epitomised by the Pic Piccadilly line of the underground. And there are those who since have come to the conclusion that the Piccadilly line is a kind of hell, particularly at the moment. For Eliot, the salient image of hell remained London in the rush hour. For us, it might well be the internet. These images surfaced in 1937 in East Coker, the second, the Four Quartets, written ten years after his conversion to Anglicanism. There's a picture of East Coker Church with somebody about to break in, I think it may be me. Um, it sets us around a contrast between the organic community of East Coker, the Somerset village, from which um, Eliot's ancestor, Andrew Eliot, had migrated to England in 1669, and the banality of contemporary London. Oh, dark, dark, dark. They all go into the dark. The vacant into stellar spaces. The vacant into the vacant. The captains, merchant bankers, eminent men of letters, the generous patrons of art, the statesmen and the rulers, distinguished civil servants, chairman of many committees, industrial lords and petty contractors, all go into the dark. And dark the sun and moon and the almanac de Gotha and the Stock Exchange Gazette, the directory of directors, and cold the sense and lost the motive of action. And we all go with them into the silent funeral. Nobody's funeral, for there is no one to bury. I said to my soul, be still and let the dark come upon you, which shall be the darkness of God. As in a theater, the lights are extinguished for the scene to be changed with a hollow rumble of wings, with a movement of darkness on darkness. And we know that the hills and the trees, the distant panorama and the bold imposing facade are all being rolled away. Or as when an underground train in the tube 
stops too long between stations, and the conversation rises and slowly fades into silence. And you see behind every face the mental emptiness deepen, leaving only the growing terror of nothing to think about. Or when, under ether, the mind is conscious, but conscious of nothing. I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope, for hope would be hope for the wrong thing. Wait without love, for love would be love of the wrong thing. There is yet faith, but the faith and the love and the hope are all in the waiting. Wait without thought, for you are not ready for thought. So the darkness shall be the light and the stillness the dancing. Whisper of running streams and winter lightning. The wild time unseen and the wild strawberry. The laughter in the garden. Echoed ecstasy not lost, but requiring, pointing to the agony of death and birth. In that section, Eliot is bringing together two things, the kind of emptiness which he'd already evoked in The Hollow Men, and something like the dark night of the soul, or the via negativa. And the thought is that we all need dry patches in order to grow. Is that a simplification? Well, surely these are, all, these are the dignitaries who actually think that their status can help them to stave off death, and it can't. However grand you are in this life, yes. you know, it's an ancient yes. idea, isn't it? Yes. It means to you, death. Yes. yes. Scepter and crown must tumble down, and the earth equal made with a poor crooked scythe and spade. Is that Shirley? Yes. But uh, do you think there was a bit of Eliot that was quite attracted to sort of worldly status and convention? And he loved reading the old vernacular Gotha, which of course was the was the was the historic account of Europe's aristocracy. He was very <laughs> versed in it. <laughs> But he seems to be saying, even the things that attract me, even these things that seem so alluring, even these things that maybe, in certain moods, I set so much store by, cannot help me and cannot help them to stave off despair. Because it's an all encroaching condition. The other thing that may be coming in here is Buddhism. Um, the, the, Buddhi the Buddhist idea of renunciation. So the whole idea of emptiness seems to come together with renunciation. It seems to me that at moments like this, Christianity and Buddhism merge. I don't think it ever quite lost that, that tinge of Buddhist teaching which always attracted him. Yes, yes, indeed. Who is the missionary character? Is it Celia, the Celia, character, yes. but it's, who, who it's, has to go through a kind of Garden of Gethsemane? She has to be. Well, in fact, yes. all, all the characters yeah. have need of prayer. Can you say anything about the laughter in the garden, which, which occurs from the... It's from Bert, Bert, Bert Norton. It's, it's, it's a memory of childhood, yes. which is also associated with the rose, of course. Well, it, it, it's a kind of nostalgic memory of, of childhood innocence, isn't it? Which is very different from adult innocence, because in order to be truly innocent as an adult, you need to be acquainted with pain, I take it. L'entre uh, de, de guerre, yes. Yeah. Yes, Malinowski and so on, and Fraser, yeah. But you can see why he moved across from Unitarianism to Trinitarian Christianity. Yeah. He actually said in a letter to his brother, Henry, who was with him in Rome in 1926, explaining why he'd moved across from Unitarianism to Anglicanism. He says, Unitarianism is a bad preparation for brass tacks like birth, copulation, death, 
hell, heaven, and insanity. For Unitarians, these all f fall within the classification of bad form. Eliot was intimately acquainted with every item on that list. He craved the religious affiliation that would give them fundamental as distinct from merely social meaning. He had, moreover, guides to this process from the deep history of the Anglican tradition. One such he had discovered in the sermons of Bishop Lancelot Andrews, perhaps the most accomplished preacher in early Stuart England. We've already met Andrews briefly in this lecture series since, if you recall, he was Herbert's teacher at Westminster School. He went on to become Bishop of Winchester, and Eliot considered him, strictly as a preacher, as distinct from a poet or wordsmith, superior to Dunn. In an essay published in 1928, the year after his conversion, Eliot set out precisely those qualities in which he thought Andrews' sermons excelled, the qualities that made him preferable to Dunn as an exponent of doctrine. Reading Dunn's sermons, Eliot says, you can never forget that you are listening to the voice of Dunn the man. So reminiscent are they of his verse, his satires and his letters. In reading Andrews, however, you forget the individuality of the preacher, forget everything except the thoughts he is addressing. Andrews' sermons therefore excel in precisely the respect in which, as set out in his essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent of 1919, Eliot had come to believe the very best poetry should ideally excel. In other words, they fulfilled a desirable and a necessary impersonality in which the writing transcended the writer, or in this case, the preaching, the preacher. When Andrews begins a sermon, Eliot remarks, from beginning to end, you are sure that he's wholly in his subject, unaware of anything else, that his emotion grows as he penetrates more deeply into his subject, that he is finally alone with the alone, with the mystery which he is seeking to grasp more and more firmly. One is reminded of the words of Arnold about the preaching of Newman. Andrew's emotion is purely contemplative. It is not personal. It is purely evoked by the object of contemplation to which it is adequate. His emotion is wholly contained in and explained by its object. So what exactly had Arnold said about Newman's preaching, which he had experienced as an undergraduate whilst Newman was the vicar of St. Mary's in Oxford? Who, Arnold had inquired rhetor rhetorically of an American audience in 1883, could resist the charm of that spiritual apparition gliding in the dim afternoon light along the aisles of St. Mary's, rising into the pulpit, and then in the most entrancing of voices, breaking the silence with words and thoughts, which were a religious music, subtle, sweet, mournful. Happy the man who in the susceptible season of youth hears such voices, they are possession forever. This is the kind of caliber Eliot discerns in Andrews. To reinforce his point, in this essay, he again quotes Dante, this time from the 31st canto of the Paradiso, at the moment when Dante meets St. Bernard, who at first does not disclose who he is. When the saint does so, the poet experiences a sensation similar to those, he says, of a pilgrim from distant Croatia, who on reaching Rome gazes for the first time on the veil of St. Veronica. And um, Dilly will now read the relevant stanza, and there's a translation on the screen. Uh, Dante Paradiso, Canto uh, 31. Qual è colui che forse di Croazia viene a vedere la Veronica nostra che per l'antica fame non sensazia. Ma dice nel pensier, finché si mostra, Signor mio Gesù Cristo, Cristo, Dio verace, or fu si fatta la sembianza vostra? Tal era io mirando alla vivace carità 
di colui che in questo mondo contemplando gustò di quella pace. So Eliot had come to connect Andrews with the idea of pilgrimage, an adventure of self-denial carried out either through a grueling physical journey or in the bishop's case via the disciplines of the pulpit. The year before the publication of this essay, the year of his baptism and conversion, Eliot transformed one of the bishop's sermons into a poem. The Journey of the Magi reworks a Christmas Day sermon that Eliot gave before James I in the chapel of Whitehall Palace on December the 25th, 1622. Since we are finding our own way towards Christmas, misled by the lights along Oxford Street, I suggest we begin with it, rather we end with it. <laughs> But first, the relevant paragraphs from Andrews's sermon. He's preaching on this text in King James, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And he also cites the Vulgate. Eci magi ab oriente venerunt Jerusalem, dicentes ubi esquinatus eus direct iudorum. Vidimus enim stellam eos in oriente, e venimus adorare eum. He then goes on to say. But then for the, dis then for the distance, tediousness and the rest, any of them were enough to mar our venomous quite. It must be no great way. First we must come, we love not that. Well fed the shepherd, yet they come but hard by, rather like them than the magi. Nay, not like them neither. For with us, the nearer, likely the further off. Our proverb is, you know, the nearer the church, the fairer from God. Nor it, must, nor it must be through no desert, over no patria. If rugged or uneven the way, if weather ill disposed, if any so little danger, it is enough to stay us. To Christ we cannot travel, but weather and way must all be fair. If not, no journey, but still and see further as indeed our religion is rather widimus, a contemplation than venomous emotion or stirring to do aught. But when we do it, we must be allowed leisure, ever veniemus, never venomous, ever coming, never come. We love to make no great haste. To other things, perhaps not odorare, the place of the worship of God, why should we? Christ is no wild cat. What talk ye of twelve days, and if it be forty days, ye shall sure, sure find his mother and him. She cannot be church then, what needs such haste? The truth is, we conceit him and his birth but slenderly, and our haste is ever thereafter. But if it be at this point, we must be out of this venomous, they like enough to leave us behind. Best to get us a new Christmas in September. We are not likely to come to Christ at this feast. Enough for venomous, but what is venomous without envenomous? And when they come, they hit or not coming at first. Nor must we, more must we think this, we must look back to that. For though it stand before they came, and came before they asked, asked before they found, and found before they worshipped, between Venomous their coming, and Adorari their worshipping, there is a truth plate of Dicentes, Ubi Est. Where first we note a double use of, the, of their Dicentes, these wise men had, as manifest what they knew not as est, that he is born. So to confess and ask what they knew not, the place where we have to like this. Secondly, set down this, that to find where he is, we must learn to ask where he is, which we full little set ourselves to. If we stumble on him, so it is. But for any asking, we trouble not ourselves, but sit still, as we say, and let nature work. And so let grace too, and so for us it shall. It what, it what well, it is said in the place of essay, he was found a non quarentibus of some that sought him not, never asked ubi est. But it is good to be holding by that place. It was their good hap and so did. But trust not to do it, it is not everybody's case that. It is better advice you should read in the psalm, haec est generatio quarentium, there is a generation of them that seek him. 
of which these were and that generation let us be. Regularly, there is no promise of the inveniators, but, but to quirete of finding that to such as seek. It is not safe to presume to find him otherwise. And now to the poem, which indirectly led to Eliot's happy marriage, since his future wife Valerie, ready as a girl in Yorkshire, came to London, sought him out, and eventually married him in 1957. He was 68, she was 31. Ruth. A cold coming we had of it. Just the worst time of the year for a journey. And such a long journey. The ways deep and the weather sharp. The very dead of winter. And the camels galled, sore-footed, refractory, lying down in the melting snow. There were times we regretted, the summer palaces on slopes, the terraces, and the silken girls bringing sherbet. Then the camel men cursing and grumbling and running away, and wanting their liquor and women and the night fires going out, and the lack of shelters, and the cities hostile and the towns unfriendly, and the villages dirty and charging high prices. A hard time we had of it. At the end, we preferred to travel all night, sleeping in snatches, with the voices singing in our ears, saying that this was all folly. Then at dawn, we came down to a temperate valley, wet below the snow line, smelling of vegetation, with a running stream and a watermill beating the darkness and three trees on the low sky. And an old white horse galloped away in the meadow. Then we came to a tavern with vine leaves over the lintel, six hands at an open door, dicing for pieces of silver and feet kicking the empty wineskins. But there was no information, and so we continued, and arrived at evening, not a moment too soon, <coughs> excuse me, finding the place, it was, you may say, satisfactory. All this was a long time ago, I remember, and I would do it again, but set down this, set down this, were we led all that way for birth or death? There was a birth, certainly. We have evidence and no doubt. I have seen birth and death, but had thought they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. We return to our places, these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here, in the old dispensation, with an alien people clutching their gods. I should be glad of another death. Comments on the poem as compared to the sermon. Well, indeed, I mean, this was actually written in 1927, shortly after his baptism. It's a poem of initiation, isn't it? Yes. The main difference, surely, is that in the Andrews, I mean, there's us and them, <laughs> they are the wise men. We are incapable of doing this, but in, in the poem, of course, we are the wise men. And we see a whole event through their eyes. It's also a poem of transformation, which is one aspect of baptism. The major, I surely, were, were Zoroastrian priests, weren't they? They weren't kings. And Zoroastrians are used to an absolute distinction between light and darkness. It seems to me that what the poem is saying is that in Christianity you transcend that div divide. You need to go into the darkness to get to the light. You need to go through hell to get through heaven. More than they're looking for. Yes, indeed. But do they really know? I mean, uh, part of them seems unconvinced. <laughs> they seem maybe or convinced despite themselves. There's still a, a resistance. Well, that's an interesting point because, of course, if <laughs> it depends whether you imagine the poem is written before or after the crucifixion. If it's written before, then the crucifixion hasn't happened. And one of the gifts that the kings bring is myrrh, which is embalming a body. Yeah. So in, right deep down in the legend is the recognition that Christ will die. Yes. I think partly what he means is that Dan is endlessly animadverting to himself. Yeah. yeah. I don't think it can really be an echo because the journey of the Magi is some years before 
Burnt Norton. But in matter, matter of fact, the opening lines of Burnt Norton are taken from an excise speech from the play Murder in the Cathedral, uh, which brings it closer in time. The Journey of the Magi is one of Eliot's so-called aerial poems, each of which was a contribution to a series of one-line pamphlets devised by his employer, Geoffrey Faber, Anglo-Catholic fellow of All Souls College, Oxford, and historian of the Oxford movement, and intended as holiday gifts. There were poems by Hardy, Eric Gill, Hilaire Belloc, David Jones, G.K. Chesterton, and Vita Sackville West. The Journey of the Magi was at number eight in the series and appeared for Christmas 1927. The title of the series was probably Geoffrey Faber's idea, but all of the poems that Eliot produced take the, take the name Ariel as a prompt for a visualization of a process of unpredicted transformation, such as serenaded by the spirit Ariel to Miranda, who in Shakespeare's The Tempest fears that her shipwrecked father is dead. Is dead. Those are pearls that are his eyes. Nothing of him doth fade, but suffers a sea change into something rich and strange. These words appear to underlie the fourth section of the wasteland called Death by Water, which evokes the drowning of one Flabus, the, the Phoenician, alluded to earlier in the poem with a parenthetical echo of Ariel's song. The journey of the Magi then is about transformation, but also about its necessary conditions. Flabas, like Bellet Miranda's father, will be metamorphosed into something exquisite, but he has to drown first, just as Dante has to visit hell before, with Virgil's help, he can climb through purgatory to heaven to recapture his Beatrice. We have all had Beatrices. I hope you find yours. This Christmas, I wish every one of you a sea change. May you may never be rich. Try at least to be just a little strange. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs>